Uh, my name is Peter Stanton. I am the publisher of the Worcester Business Journal. And um, as you know from uh, sort of all the marketing and communication that's gone on this on about this healthcare forum, the second one we've held, um, we're here to sort through the Affordable Care Act and what it means to Massachusetts employers. And um, we've got a terrific uh, keynote speaker and a bunch of and and and, and a panel that are going to be able to address. Uh, both uh, the larger issues of, of that law and how we all can comply, and obviously some of the more technical elements of it as well. So um, I want to say a special thanks to um, all of our sponsors, our, our presenting sponsor, Fallon Community Health Plan, um, our corporate sponsor, uh, Benefit Development Group, and Michael Sosis and his firm, and our media partners, WTAG, and specifically their legalese uh, show that runs on Saturdays. Um, and, and, and just a note uh, with Fallon, uh, the Fallon Community Health Plan has been a, a terrific partner in this event for two years in a row. And I want to give a special thanks to Bob Nolan, uh, Yannis Leapens, and Christine Cassidy for sort of meeting with us several times and being part of the brain trust that helped us focus this event on the most important issues for business. Uh, uh, what, uh, about what business people need to know about this law. So thank you for uh, their contribution behind the scenes as well as in supporting this event. And we're first going to hear from uh, Fallon Community Health Plan, Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing, Dave Prezik. We'll have a few comments. Dave, you're up. I'd like to thank our friends at the Worcester Business Journal for putting this forum together for the second year in a row, and thank you all for joining us today. I believe it's a necessary discussion about the current and future provisions of the Affordable Care Act and their impact on Massachusetts requirements. For those of you who thought 2006 reform created big changes in the health insurance marketplace, I think we're in for a bumpy ride. Um, everybody's got a couple of these at the table. I have six on my desk, right? <laughs> Uh, because I spend the vast majority of our day dealing with all of the changes that we have, uh, certainly in our business. So uh, take one of these home uh, with you. Um, the Affordable Care Act is changing and will continue to change the way we all, insurers, brokers, uh, and employers do business. So it's extremely important for us to understand the new rules and provisions and how to be compliant with them. It's not just about health insurers. Employers, check with your brokers and tax professionals to make sure you're doing everything that you need to do to be compliant. Brokers can count on FCHP to keep you up to date with timely communications through our Broker Edge, our healthcare reform section on fchp.org, and frequent contact through our service representatives in the field. So I'd like to recognize a few groups for their efforts regarding healthcare reform. Certainly the broker community uh, for reaching out to and helping educate the state legislators about our industry. The administration for the first waiver on rating requirements and the legislator for supporting it. And for the record, FCHP supports a permanent waiver for Massachusetts. And I think we actively need to be engaged uh, with our state officials to push for that waiver. We figured this out a long time ago, and I feel we're taking a little bit of a step back with some of uh, the changes uh, as a result of ACA. One final note, FCHP, C FCHP has created a helpful guide to understanding healthcare reform in ACA. It's on your table. It has detailed information about current and upcoming provisions outlined by the ACA. If you didn't get one, uh, please grab one on the way out. Uh, pay attention to your email boxes. There are lots of changes that are happening. This is a very fluid discussion. Uh, we try and keep everyone as up to date as possible through email exchanges and certain postings on our web. So again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. We're in for an interesting discussion and I'll turn it back over to Peter. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, Attorney Allison Cohen, who is the principal of the Cohen Law Services and host of the popular legal talk show, Legal Ease, which focuses on issues of health care, law, elder law, and employment law, and it runs on WTAG at 11 on Saturdays, right? Okay, perfect. So Allison is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Allison, come on up. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and to introduce this year's keynote speaker, Glenn Shore, to our second annual Healthcare Forum. Glenn Shore has held many prominent positions over the years. Before serving in the Patrick Murray administration, 
He was a senior policy director and assistant attorney general in the office of the attorney general of Massachusetts. As well, Mr. Shore was a senior policy aide and counsel to former U.S. Representative Martin Meehan and U.S. Senator Charles Schumer. He was also a public interest attorney defending the constitutionality of our nation's campaign finance laws in U.S. Supreme Court litigation. Glenn Shore was a leading policy point person for Governor Deval Patrick in implementing health care reform in Massachusetts. As Assistant Secretary for Health Care Policy and Deputy General Counsel at ANF, Mr. Shore was playing a crucial role in overseeing the early policy decisions of the Health Care Connector and the financing of health care reform. He also helped fashion the recommendation of the Special Commission on the Health Care Payment System, which sparked policy focus and market progress towards health care payment and delivery systems reform in Massachusetts. Mr. Shore was appointed Executive Director of the Health Connector in June of 2010. While at the Connector, Glenn Shore oversaw programs, policies, operations, and staff of the Commonwealth's official public health insurance exchanges, a cornerstone of the state's historic health care reform law of 2006 and the model for health insurance exchanges nationwide under the landmark Federal Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. As of January of this past year, Glenn Shore was officially sworn in by Governor Deval Patrick as Secretary of the Executive Office of Administration and Finance. This esteemed position requires Mr. Shore to be responsible for managing state finances, which includes the preparation of the governor's budget recommendations, development of the Commonwealth's capital budget, managing budgetary activities across the state government, and developing long-term fiscal policy. Mr. Shore is also responsible for overseeing the state agencies that provide core administration services in the Commonwealth which consists of the collection of state taxes, the administration of IT services, and the management of human resources in the state government. Phew, that was a mouthful. Mr. Shore graduated from Yale University with a BA in history and attended that little unknown school across the Charles River from my alma mater, BU Law School, known as Hartford University. Or was that Harvard University? Of course it is, the same law school that five of the nine current sitting justices of the United States Supreme Court graduated from. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Glenn Shore. Thanks, Allison. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks for having me back, actually, last year at this time. Um, I had the opportunity to actually serve on the panel for this event. The keynote speaker was Attorney General Martha Coakley. Um, I could not have imagined that one year later I'd come back in the capacity of Secretary for Administration and Finance. I'm still, in light of the responsibilities that Allison laid out for you, pondering whether that was a good career move for me. Um, is certainly not helping my stress level, but I'm glad to see the stress balls on the table. Um, I'll add it to my collection. Um, anyway, thank you again. Thanks to the Worcester Business Journal for having me. Thank you uh, to the sponsors of this event. Uh, and thank you, of course, to the panelists who will help answer um, some of your questions after I have the opportunity to give a few remarks. What I'd like to do this morning is help you make a little bit of sense of the Affordable Care Act. Um, help you, the businesses here, the brokers here, in your efforts to prepare and present a little bit of perspective on what to make of it. Um, to understand the Affordable Care Act, I think it is important to start with one of its foundations, Chapter 58 uh, of the Acts of 2006, in other words, the state's historic health reform initiative. The central focus of the state's historic health reforms was to expand coverage uh, in light of the health and financial benefits of having health insurance. Um, and that law relied on a couple of key levers to do so. Um, most importantly, the law broadened eligibility for subsidized health insurance by creating the 
Commonwealth Care Program at the Health Connector, there are now over 206,000 people enrolled in Commonwealth Care. That's a significant portion of the newly insured in Massachusetts. Um, health reform in Massachusetts reformed the individual or non-group market. It merged that market with a small group market and created the connector to be a functioning shopping place for non-group coverage. Um, by virtue of those provisions we saw with the inception of health reform, double-digit declines in premiums for non-group coverage. And as of March 2011, there were an additional 33,000 people in the individual market. So these are the, one of the areas where the ranks of the insured grow um, under Chapter 58. Um, one of the most innovative features of Chapter 58, as you probably know, was the creation of an individual mandate, at the time the only one of its kind in the nation. Um, this requires adults who can afford insurance to have it. Um, there are many manifestations of how the individual mandate broadened the ranks of the insured in Massachusetts. One that just, just jumped out at me, uh, the young adult uninsured in Massachusetts uh, went from over 26% in 2005, 2006 to just over 8% in 2009, 2010. That's probably a function of two things. Uh, broadening the ability of young people to stay on their parents' policy, which was another feature of health reform in Massachusetts, but also the individual mandate, too. Um, we have great results to show for our state's health reform initiative. Um, as of 2011, 97% of the Commonwealth insured, the highest rates of coverage in the nation. Um, and um, as expected and as hoped, uh, greater access to health insurance made made for greater uh, access to care. We have fewer adults with unmet health care needs, more adults with a usual source of care, and more adults using preventive and dental care. We have more employers offering coverage. And I think in Chapter 58, you can see the power and the potential of public health insurance exchanges. Uh, the Connectors Commonwealth Care Program, a market-based subsidized health insurance program, has exhibited average annual premium trend of about 1% over the life of the program. That's a great result. Um, and the connector has been a platform for new insurers to enter our market, uh, current insurers to enter new markets, uh, and for experimentation with different network designs and greater choice for employers. Um, most notably, of course, Chapter 58 was a model for national health care reform, um, ultimately enacted in the Affordable Care Act. Now, the Affordable Care Act does reward us for being an early starter on the path of health care reform. Um, the foremost example, um, and I know this one, uh, having spent a lot of time building this year's budget, um, this year's budget benefits from over $200 million of additional combined savings and revenues by virtue of the Affordable Care Act. Um, we benefit starting January 1, January 1, 2014 of a increase in our Medicaid matching funds from 50% to 75% for the population for which we expanded subsidized coverage in 2006. Um, we get reimbursement for a subset of legal immigrants that we have been covering since 2006, except for a little bit of a gap period, but to date without federal reimbursement. Um, this is this $200 million increment for the federal budget, for the state budget, excuse me, which helps us in other ways support our health care system, uh, pay hospitals more fairly, is just for a half of a state fiscal year. Um, these sums, this budget benefit will increase when we get into subsequent fiscal years where we'll see the full year effect of these savings and revenues and federal reimbursement for this portion of our subsidized population will go up over time from 75% to 90%. That's a great benefit from being an early starter on the path to health reform. Um, obviously, though, the reason why we're here today is that the ACA is not, though based on Chapter 58 in significant ways, it's not identical to Chapter 58. Um, and that creates opportunities, that creates challenges, um, and I'd like to call out some of the ways in which it helps move us forward and also some of the things we're going to need to wrestle with as we attempt to reconcile our own state's health reform initiative, um, which has been here for seven years, uh, with the new federal law. Um, one thing that jumps out with the new federal law is it does plug some gaps in Chapter 58. Um, for example, it opens up subsidized coverage to low-income workers who had offers of employer coverage but couldn't afford it. 
um, but on account of the employer offer, did not have access to subsidized coverage to date. Um, it broadens eligibility for subsidized coverage from three to four times the poverty level. Um, we have people who are just over three times the poverty level, may not have an offer of coverage through their jobs, accordingly struggle to buy health insurance. Right now, they don't qualify for subsidies. The new federal law provides federal subsidies. Focusing on that population and the lowest wage workers who haven't been able to access subsidized coverage to date, those are portions of our population that may very well account for a meaningful portion of our uninsured. So this is an opportunity for us to plug some gaps and hopefully even broaden the ranks of the insured in Massachusetts. Um, I would also note that the ACA plugs some gaps in Medicare, and that's of note to Massachusetts seniors and disabled. Um, most importantly, it closes the Medicare prescription drug donut hole. Um, to date, nearly 60,000 of Massachusetts seniors saved an average of $667 each on prescription drugs in 2012, and will save more when the donut hole is completely closed. The ACA also simplifies state health insurance programs and makes it easier to sign up. It, by my count, reduces eight uh, state subsidized health insurance programs spread over three organizations to four programs spread over two. That's great for members, it helps them uh, more readily navigate their way into state health programs. I think it's easier for insurers and providers as well. They don't have as many arms of the state reaching out to them, imposing conflicting paperwork requirements um, and creating administrative burdens in the process. Um, and access to subsidized health insurance will be significantly streamlined. What can be a multi-week wait today um, will, by virtue of some of the electronic connections being built between the state and the federal government, uh, be quicker, more accurate, and more readily and efficiently get people who are qualified for subsidized insurance into the ranks of coverage, which is a good thing. Um, the ACA also, um, what I would say, reshuffles the deck in a number of ways. Uh, in some ways, depending upon where you sit, um, would be viewed positively, in other ways would be viewed as a challenge or negatively. Um, and these are opportunities and challenges for us to work through, and we're gonna need to work through them. Um, on the issue of employer responsibility, like the state, uh, the ACA does have a provision that looks to whether employers offer coverage to their employees, and depending upon whether or not they do and the degree they do, uh, potentially imposes a penalty. Um, the federal rule is quite different from the state rule, um, and the good news is by virtue of some recent federal action, our state's employers will have more time uh, to get their arms around the federal rule. Um, the effective date for that provision was delayed from January 1, 2014 to January 1, 2015. Um, couple of things I would call out about this issue. Um, by virtue of the new federal rule and the elimination of a couple of weeks ago of the state's fair share test, um, no longer will a coverage test apply to employers with under 50 employees. Um, that's certainly one way in which the combination of the ACA and changes to Chapter 58 streamline administrative burdens for small employers. Um, employers that have been paying an unemployment health insurance contribution to support the medical security program will see starting in 2014 a 25% cut in that. And again, as I indicated, there will be more time for employers to learn the federal standard, um, understand it, and take the steps they need to comply. Uh, the benefits floor in the Massachusetts market will largely be the same as what it is today, as Massachusetts is maintaining its minimum creditable coverage rules with some tweaks to better match the cost sharing limits under the Affordable Care Act. One thing to note, I think the most important thing to note is the ACA, particularly I think in the small and non-group market, requires coverage to be offered in metallic tiers based on the actuarial value of health insurance plans. That is the rule both inside the health connector and outside the health connector. So it is possible, on the one hand, your existing benefit plan may remain the same. There may be a couple of tweaks to make sure that the plan that you're being offered falls into one of these actuarial tiers. One benefit of the metallic tiers is it does organize 
um, health plans based on their value in a way that is not the case today and may facilitate better comparison shopping. Um, the ACA also has a number of provisions that I'm sure you've heard a lot about that have the effect of redistributing costs within our merged market. The provisions that I'd call out here don't in aggregate add costs, but they do redistribute them. Um, and there are some challenges associated with that. Um, the one that you've probably heard of most has to do with rating factors. Um, the ACA significantly streamlines the rating factors that we currently use today in the small non-group market to actually take what's known as a base rate and make it into an actual premium uh, for small groups and individuals. Now, uh, depending upon what study you look at, um, I think it's roughly fair to say about half of the merged market gets a, um, a rate decrease by virtue of the streamlining of the rating factors, but notably about half gets a rate increase on account of this, um, and absent any other intervention, uh, for certain segments of the market, um, the swings could, absent, again, any other intervention, be extremely large. For example, I noted in a recent Wakeley study that three points, abs again, absent any other intervention, 3.6% of small group subscribers could see uh, in excess of a 20% increase by virtue of the redistribution of these costs from um, moving costs from, indiv uh, from individuals and smaller small employers, namely to larger small employers. Um, also, um, the streamlining of the rating factors means while small group purchasing co-ops can continue to save money by employing limited and tiered networks uh, or higher deductible plans, they would no longer be permitted to enjoy a special rating discount. Now, this is a very uh, challenging provision of the ACA. Um, in Massachusetts, we have a merged market. Um, I indicated that earlier. That was one of the keys to some of our success in Chapter 58 in making coverage less expensive for individuals. Um, but based on our sort of knowledge of this market and our experience, these provisions and our rating factors were very carefully calibrated. They were designed, for example, to make coverage more affordable for individuals without unduly and overly, overly burdening small employers. Uh, they were designed to allow for experimentation with small group purchasing co-ops, but put some limits and rules around it um, so as to protect the rest of the market from adverse risk selection impacts. The institution of a national rule for permissible rating factors um, does not allow us to maintain those refinements in our market. Um, and we obviously wish we could have refined them. Um, we are continuing to work on this issue. One thing I certainly would want to call out for you is that um, in Massachusetts, um, we are the only state in the nation that will have a transition period to move from, a, a multi-year transition period to move from our rating factors to the more streamlined set of ACA rating factors. We have three years to do this. This is the direct result of Governor Patrick's personal advocacy uh, at the highest levels of the administration, including personally with President Obama, personally with Secretary Sebelius, and personally with other high-ranking people in the administration to educate them about what we've done in Massachusetts, to highlight our success, um, he asked for the broadest flexibility possible, including a complete waiver uh, to do what we currently do on these issues. He did not secure that to date, um, but he did secure the only three-year transition period in the nation. That three-year transition period is real relief for our small employers. In fact, as a result of that, um, according to the Wakeley study, three-quarters of small groups will experience a swing of less uh, than 10% up or down in 2014. Uh, having said that, our work is not done on this issue. Uh, the legislature recently enacted a provision requiring us to ask again for a full out waiver on this issue and the governor and the administration will comply and do our best. Um, the combination of rating factor dynamics and the institution of risk adjustment in the small non-group market does mean that in 2014 um, we will see a lot of variability in the market. Um, depending upon where you sit, 
your premium if you want to stay with your existing insurer and your existing level of health coverage may be the same. It may go up, it may go up meaningfully, it may go down, it may go down meaningfully. Um, obviously, and I'll underscore this at the end, really, really important to pay close attention and work closely with, the, with your brokers to understand your options. Um, the administration has, or the state's division of insurance has not yet um, uh, 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 made its decisions on base rates for coverage, which are obviously an important element of understanding and building up a total premium, but that should come reasonably soon. Um, and come 2016, um, not yet, but a couple of years down the road, the size of the market or the sort of size cutoff of an employer that will be swept into these rules goes from 50 to 100. So that's gonna be another important issue for us to tackle over the next couple of years. Um, even putting aside the ACA, um, but I think the ACA dynamics underscore the importance of this, um, being a smart shopper for health insurance has never been more important, um, and thus it's, a, in my view, a good thing that the ACA strengthens the health connector. It invests significant federal resources in upgrading the connector's website, um, with shop, new shopping and support tools for brokers and businesses, and makes many of its smaller, small business customers eligible for new tax credits to help them pay the cost of health insurance. By virtue of these provisions and others, this way the health connector can serve as a tool not only to open the doors of coverage to the formerly uninsured, but also to strengthen the hand of small employers uh, already offering insurance and the brokers who serve them to find the best deals. Um, alongside what the, the connector must do to implement the ACA, um, it is offering an entirely new product portfolio for 2014, including for the first time, tiered cost sharing plans and dental coverage, and the highest level of carrier participation ever, so I think it merits a look. Um, and after, of course, we enacted coverage reforms in Massachusetts in 2006, we recognize that for coverage reforms to be sustainable, um, and to strengthen our economy, to strengthen businesses of all sizes, and protect our families, we needed to do something to contain healthcare costs. Um, there have been a number of levers pulled on that issue over the last couple of years. One aspect of it in 2010 was the governor instituting heightened oversight of premiums for small businesses and individuals through the state's division of insurance. Last year, um, we saw the enactment of Chapter 224, which set an overall healthcare cost uh, growth target for the Commonwealth, the first of its kind in the nation, uh, and provided a number of tools to help contain costs by moving the healthcare delivery system towards more coordinated, uh, more evidence-driven, and prevention-focused care. The ACA actually bolsters these efforts. There are 12 grants included in the ACA that support transformation in the delivery of care, and Massachusetts is capitalizing on many of them. For example, five Massachusetts healthcare systems were selected as pilot ACOs in a Medicare shared savings program. So when you take a look at the whole picture uh, regarding the ACA, I think it's hard not to say that the ACA, or, well, I tried to do the sentence without a double negative. The ACA, in my view, is very positive for Massachusetts. It continues breaking down barriers to coverage it is an opportunity for us to streamline, streamline state health insurance programs, streamline administrative burdens for small businesses. It puts additional tools in the hands of individuals and small employers and the brokers who serve them to be empowered shoppers when it comes to health insurance. And it provides billions of additional federal resources for the Commonwealth, not just for the state budget, but for community health centers, and dollars to strengthen payment reform in the Commonwealth, which is among the most important investments we can make in affordable, sustainable, high-quality health care. Positive does not mean perfect. Um, Massachusetts has more flexibility than any other state in the nation when it comes to the Affordable Care Act by virtue of having a transition period to implement the challenging rating factor changes. Uh, but we'll continue to see if there are ways for us to maximize our flexibility to do what's best for Massachusetts. And regardless of the outcome, we will continue to work with you uh, through the areas where the ACA is challenging. Um, for employers and for brokers, 
I think the advice and the counsel is obvious. It is critical to pay close attention. Um, this is in a landscape with, for some, shifting premiums. This is a landscape with shifting regulatory environments. For small employers, work with your broker, if you have one, to understand your options so you know every tool you have to get the best possible deal for yourself, uh, whether you're getting a rate cut by virtue of the ACA or whether you're getting a rate increase. Um, take the time to understand the new rules for employer responsibility with more time. There is an opportunity to understand those rules better and take advantage of the opportunities um, to learn more about the ACA writ large. Um, one thing I'm aware of is that the Health Connector and Associated Industries of Massachusetts have organized a series of forums across the Commonwealth uh, to educate employers and brokers about the ACA-related changes. Uh, there is actually one on September 16th at UMass Medical School Faculty Conference Room, so there's one in this area. There will be others in other areas of the Commonwealth. These are the types of educational sessions that could be valuable in furthering your stand understanding of the ACA and best positioning yourselves for success. Um, this is a multi-year endeavor, just like Chapter 58 was. Um, we never get away from health reform. It never ends, and everything is about implementation. Um, but the administration, um, it, it will work as closely with you as we can to make this a success for the Commonwealth, using every lever we have to make it a success. It has been a privilege. Um, I know that is Governor Patrick's perspective to work with you to make Chapter 58 a success, and we'll keep plugging away to make um, health reform, a success in Massachusetts, and maintain our status as a nation leader in this field. Thank you.